Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. And today we're going to be switching back and forth between uh, one page of notes. Our topic matter today is on exercises to burn fat. Oh boy, the controversy looms depending on who wants to serve themselves the most. But um, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and prevent as best a science that I possibly can for you to make a good decision on what exercises that you can do within your own limitations to burn fat. Now, when we talk about burning fat, there's a specific fat burning range, and you'll see this on most cardiovascular equipment. And basically, the fat burning range is you take 220 minus your age, and you multiply it times 60 or 70%, or 0.6 and 0.7. So if you're age 40, for example, um, you would do that, and it would, the heart rate, your fat burning range would be between 108 and 135 heartbeats per minute. So if you were to take your heart rate, that would be your optimal fat burning range. Now, it would be simple and nice if that was the only answer to it, and we get on the elliptical or we get on the tread uh, treadmill, we'd set it for that, and that would be our ability to burn off fat. And there is some truth to that. The only thing is we also have to think in terms of whether or not your body's going to burn off or has any blood sugars or muscle sugars to burn off. So. When you're looking at trying to burn off fat, the best time to burn off from a fat burning is first thing in the morning, as long as you don't have diabetes or hypoglycemia, would be first thing in the morning, pick some sort of fat burning uh, training, not involving weight training or that type of thing. First thing in the morning, on an empty stomach, you go out and you take that brisk walk you do the bicycle ride, you hike. Um, let me give you the list. I think I probably have them on here. Jogging, hiking, treadmill, low impact classes, a nice yoga class that moves in a fat burning range, a nice uh, lower Pilates class, and then of course some swimming um, aerobics. Now see, when we're first thing in the morning, we, our liver glycogen as a general rule, our sugars that we store, our little gas tank is empty. Now, once that gas tank is empty and we, the body gets in like that cardiovascular fat burning mode, when you start to exercise, your body will not have sugars to use and it generally, in that fat burning range, will look for fat to burn. Now, if I was to go out and do a heavy weight training, you know, on an empty stomach first thing in the morning, in an anaerobic uh, state, what that means when I do not have, okay, in order to burn off fat, your body requires oxygen. And when you're in that fat burning range of 60 to 70% of that maximum heart rate, what occurs is your body will use oxygen and that oxygen helps you burn off fat. When you're in like a heavy spin class or a Zumba class or that type of thing, where you're going towards your maximum heart rate, what happens is, is your body will not or does not pull or convert oxygen to burn off fat. So you're much more likely in the same amount of period of time for such an extended effort, you're not going to burn any additional amount of fat than if you were out there jogging or swimming or that type of thing. So when you're talking about strictly fat burning, first thing in the morning is the best time you're going to want to look to those lower impact types of fat burning. Now, let's say you're off going to work uh, first thing in the morning. You don't work out in the morning. You know, you, you work out before you go home or you work out in the evening hours. Okay, chances are good you're going to have some sort of glycogen, blood sugars. You know, you've eaten throughout the day. You're, um, you know, you maintain those sugars so you can perform some your various tasks throughout the day. What that means is you're going to have to do something to burn off the blood sugars first before you can get in that fat burning mode. Now, the studies are supporting some very interesting, um, uh, good research regarding this. And that would be a couple of different aspects. You can do what's called interval training. And that means you really, really put it all out and then you kind of do a, a fat burning, and then you put it all out, 
So it's kind of like the like we used to run out, run uh, our wind sprints, and then we would walk back, and we'd run our 50 yards, and then we would walk back. Interval training burns off blood sugars really, really, really quick. And really good training for burning off blood sugars fast. And in addition, elongating the body's ability to burn off fat is doing some sort of resistance training. So um, let's say you could get a nice um, set of exercise bands for resistance, some ni nice weight training, or go to your local gym and do a good 30 minutes of good weight training where you're only taking 30 to 60 seconds between each set that you may perform. Now, the benefit to this is not only are you going to fat burn, but you're also going to get the muscles in tone. Now, when muscles are in tone and, and in, in better condition, or if you build muscle, you're going to burn more calories. And it's generally about 10 more calories for every pound of muscle that you have. So if you think in terms of in a day, 10, 10 to 50, depends on how large the muscle. So let's say, for example, I put on 10 pounds of muscle. I'm going to burn, without any additional effort, between 100 and 500 extra calories in a day just from having some toned muscle that burns off blood sugars. Now, by doing that, that also prevents storage of body fat. So very recommended that you do some sort of resistance training. You know, you warm up, get the body warmed, then for about five minutes maybe on the treadmill or whatever, then do your 30 minutes to 40 minutes of resistance training. You will have burn off your blood sugars, and then afterwards if you go and sit and do some type of fat burning, that means that 60 to 70 percent range, you will have toned the muscles, you go in, you will have burned off your blood sugars, and then you can do your nice little fat burning treadmill, and I'll be doggone if you won't burn off fat. It is so easy for us to think in terms of we've got to push it hard, we've got to push it hard. And from a cardiovascular training standpoint, that would be true. And, and you want to occasionally push your heart rate to that 80 or 85%. And, and I think it's great. That's why interval training, weight training will do that. That'll bring that high and low up because that does burn off blood sugars and it is great for the cardiovascular. But when we're solely talking about weight loss and muscle toning and overall health and well-being, you do not need to push it to the extreme. Um, I've seen these recent programs, um, and gosh, I, I don't want to mention them, but let's just put it this way. One of them is extremely insane, and the name is the same. You look at those workouts, I have seen more injuries occur as a result of that, or people who do extreme boot camp types of, of exercising, where you're out there, you haven't run for 20 years, and all of a sudden this person's yelling behind you to run as fast as you go. And, you know, for maybe a week or two, and then I see tons of injuries. So you have to consider your body type. You have to consider your goals and where your fitness level is at a particular time period. Because when you're talking about burning off fat, you get injured doing an insane workout. And what occurs then is you're not going to be burning fat. You're going to be sitting on your tushy waiting for your wounds to heal. Very, very important that you keep in mind that you suit it for whatever your particular body type is and what you need. Now, another excellent thing to consider for prevention of injury as well as fat burning are not only strength training and then burning or using a little bit of, um, of uh, you know, fat burning types of cardio exercises, there's also stretching. Now, sometimes we forget that exercises such as yoga or Pilates, Pilates also, are strength training at, this, at the same time as you're getting the stretching and motion as well, too. Now, when you stretch a muscle, in addition, you also do release sugars, you elongate, and you prevent injury so that over a lengthy period of time, you can continue your fat burning. So when you're considering an overall training program, number one, consider your body type. 
Number two, considering how physically fit you are. What are your physical limitations structurally? Is there arthritis? We know that when you get sedentary and you have arthritis, the arthritis gets worse. So if I can get some of my um, customers I know that are in their 60s and 70s that are over at the swim class next door, they're doing it first thing in the morning, they're burning off fat, they're getting some resistance, and they have a lot less issues with arthritis, and they're burning off the fat. There's some good studies that have come out um, on using weight training, and probably one of the very favorite ones I have, and Bill will switch it over and, and show you, is one out of Purdue University. And what it found, it, it took a, a large class of, uh, of men and women, and they did 20 to 30 minutes of low impact type of uh, weight training. You know, we're not talking Zumba. We're talking a nice little resistance weight training, moderate weights, and then followed it with about 30 minutes of cardiovascular. So we had about a total of three hours worth of weight training and then, um, uh, which is, you know, 30 minutes a day, and then a, a half hour of cardiovascular, you know, fat burning range. On an average, the average man gained four pounds of muscle and lost four pounds of fat. And I think that study was over 12 weeks. That's pretty substantial. So we've not only toned and gained muscle, that aids and abeds an ability to burn off 40 to 200 more calories in a day without any additional effort, we also burned off the fat. So remember too, when you change your body fat composition, you get rid of body fat, huh, you become less insulin resistant. So as we get leaner, we have less body fat, we have a little bit more toned muscle, then what happens is, is when you do do your resistance and your fat burning, the weight stays off. So as you're considering what modality that you want to take, number one, make sure it's sane. Number two, make sure it meets what your goals are. And remember too, strength training, a moderate, um, low impact cardiovascular, strengthens overall joints gets circulation going, helps with blood pressure, a lot of different things. You go out there and you raise your blood pressure extremely high on extreme athletics when you've not been training for a while and there could be um, the risk of certain uh, issues as far as injury as well as heart attack could rise substantially. So be sane about what you do. If you uh, need a copy of this, um, we'll have this downloaded onto youtube.com um, forward slash VH film, and you can kind of see all the steps involved. But once again, take a peek at your overall physical fitness. Talk to a good physical trainer. Um, now, I'm not talking about oh, some 18 year old kid that just has gotten out of a, a personal training. Talk to somebody who's walked the talk, an experienced good professional trainer, and then get involved with a good nutritionist because as we bring in the diet along with the physical exercise, then we have the long-term fat burning and metabolism changes. Next, we're gonna be moving on to the fitness portion of our show, thank you. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show and today we are going to talk about posture. Now um, I'm a yoga instructor and I'm a certified personal trainer and I have been for 20 years now. <sighs> posture and this is a huge one and I get a lot of complaints from people about their backs hurting, their digestion being problematic and I thought we'd talk about posture. Now this type of chair that I'm in, if you noticed, when, I, when I'm leaning up against the back, I have pretty good supported posture. When we talk about posture, when the spine is upright and aligned, what that means is basically all the organs are gonna be upright and aligned. 
Most of our traditional American couches, when we sit down after we've had that thousand calorie dinner, we're sitting down on the couch and we're like this. Okay, we're, 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 we, I can't even duplicate it here because this chair has such good support. But you're sinking down into the couch, your organs are folding, and then you wonder why you have acid indigestion and other issues and, and your back muscles, or you're sitting at the computer desk like this the whole time all hunched over. So we need to make a cognizant effort about our posture, because as you grow older, all of those back muscles, the spinal erectors, will have weakened, and your spine, you'll literally have that nice little curvature that comes along as we grow older. So find yourself, and, and this goes or bodes well also at the workplace, find yourself a good chair that supports. Um, this, a chair like this is perfectly, uh, perfectly good. It's relatively inexpensive. Adjust it for your height. Your feet touch the ground. You've got a good support. And be cognizant that you're leaning back with that support. And if you're on the computer or whatever, do your best to not be hunched over. I had a good friend of mine that actually, literally, she would come back from lunch. She would lean over her desk typing. And then in the afternoon, she'd have severe agony and pain in her gastrointestinal because she was leaning up against the desk. So having the good posture, once again, supports the organs so that your organs can maintain their proper ability to digest the food, elimination, and support of other bodily functions. In addition, you'll have a lot less back pain and you'll maintain those spinal erector, the integrity of your spinal erectors. Okay, good chairs, good posture. Think about it at home uh, when you're sitting on that dumpy old couch. Find something maybe that has a little bit better construction next time you purchase a couch or that good old solid back chair or bring the computer desk in to watch TV. Keep that posture up. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show. And with us today is Ralph Turciano. And thank you for the intro. And to start off with, what do Californians not have in common with Macedonians? Well, to answer that question first, we voted not to label GM foods, where the Macedonians decided to imprison people that sell GM foods. In an article headlined, Macedonia to Jail Individuals Producing or Selling GM Foods, they went like this. While the Serb government has promised to find and punish individuals and organizations responsible for spreading false stories about natural milk as poisonous, in order for the population to favor the import of GM milk, hmm, false stories of natural milk is poisonous. FDA, oh sorry, we're not in Serbia or Macedonia. All right, obviously we're not the industrial age where basically we were adding chalk to rancid milk and decided to pasteurize it so we can make rancid milk more edible, but that's the past, who cares? Macedonia went a step farther and enacted laws that not just ban GM foods, but to jail those who use GM seeds to grow their products. They went further. We have changes in our laws whose purpose is protection of the quality of our seeds and natural pesticides, which allow us to protect our farmers at the same time regulating a dangerous industry that can easily damage the health and safety of Macedonia citizens through the usage of phytosanitary products, stated the government spokesman Alexander Georgiev. Wow, what an incredible country. They're not bowing to corporate interests, but they're basically appealing to the protection of the public. And they also went further. At today's government session, Macedonia, not California, sorry, penal laws were changed and individuals caught selling GM seeds would be fined monetarily. And if the individual did not have a license to sell issued by the public health mystery, the fine will be increased 10 times. Five to 10 years jail time is predicted on top of the monetary fine. For organizations who break the law and sell or produce GM foods, apart from the high monetary fines, they're facing five to 20 years jail time. Well, I guess there's one place in the world that Bill Gates will not be visiting, will probably be Macedonia. 
And also, too, why would they be so interested in protecting their natural crops? Because once you introduce a genetically modified organism into the environment, you can't turn it back. It's difficult. And if farmers, as far as the welfare of farmers and small farms, well, just ask what happened in the United States if by some odd chance some seeds are found that are genetically modified end up in their crops. It's a long court case for those small farmers. Why? Because it's not about feeding the world. It's about patenting and monopolizing the food supply. The Macedonians realize in Europe that up to 50% of the food produced is wasted. So why even bother introducing genetically modified crops which have a chance of destabilizing the environment when you don't even have your own act together to begin with in regards to food waste to start? Well, congratulations, Macedonia, California. Something to look forward to in the future. All right. In an article published in the Journal of Biological Trace Element Research, they have confirmed autism and heavy metals once again. Now here goes the controversy. They did a study and the Arizona University researchers report that children with autism had higher levels of several toxic metals in their blood and urine compared to typical children. How high did these autistic kids have or how much higher? We're not talking five or ten percent. Autistic kids are really bearing a tremendous burden. How high is that burden now? Let's start. In the red blood cells, 41 percent higher lead, 74 percent mm -hmm. higher thallium, 115 percent higher tin, and 44 percent higher tungsten. Wow. Now keep in mind, they didn't mention mercury because mercury is real controversial and don't want their scientific funding cut. But they did also say too, it was found that 38 to 47 percent of the variation of autism severity was associated with the level of several toxic metals with cadmium and mercury being the most strongly associated. Now remember a little while back we did a thing on high fructose corn syrup. Now obviously high fructose corn syrup being a sweetener is not direct cause per se, but however though, what's high fructose corn syrup do? And how do they relate high fructose corn syrup to autism? because it deactivated the body's ability to diminish or reduce heavy metals in the body, especially lead and mercury. Mm -hmm. So think about it next time someone gets a vaccine, they may have a little bit of thimerosal in it if they still do, or so on and so forth, or paint an old building, you name it. The high fructose corn syrup makes children which would not normally be susceptible to heavy metal damage susceptible. They also said too, Adams previously published a study on the use of DMSA, which is a chelation agent and FDA approved medication for removing toxic metals. The open label study found that DMSA was generally safe and effective at removing some toxic metals. It also found that DMSA therapy improved some of the symptoms of autism. The biggest improvement was for children with the highest level of toxic metals. This study was funded by the Autism Research Institute and was published in the Journal of Biological Trace Element Research. Again, toxic metals directly related to autism. Something which is very newsworthy, but obviously not newsworthy for the United States. Which brings me to the next thing, because you'll never find the news to begin with. Because we're too busy reporting on a local news about broken down elevators in some off building someplace. Because why? Because we have no investigative journalism here in the United States. All right, here is the headline, which makes it quite interesting. Fish mislabeling widespread in the U.S. And 84% of white tuna is a species which causes distressing gastrointestinal side effects. What does that mean? 84% of what's being sold as white tuna is not white tuna. And let's move a little further into the article. 59% of fish sold as tuna in restaurants and grocery stores is not actually tuna. Well, I'll describe what it is in a second. Fish juice sold as white tuna is usually something called escolar, which causes massive gastrointestinal stress, diarrhea, anal leakage, and <laughs> other stuff if you consume just more than six ounces. And that's, yeah. The mislabeling of fish is widespread across the United States. A shocking new study has revealed and this was done by a conservation group called Oceana. They analyzed the DNA of 1,215 seafood samples 
from 674 retail outlets in 21 states between 2010 and 2012. So they did their homework before they announced this. One alarming discovery saw that a huge amount of fish sold as white tuna as Ashkeliaskalar, which caused uncontrollable you know what. So sometimes it may be your posture, sometimes it may be the white tuna that you think you're consuming. Doubtful fish was labeled, mislabeled 74% of the time in sushi venues. The study found mislabeling in 27 of the 46 seafood types tested. It revealed that 59% of the fish sold as tuna in the United States restaurant in grocery stores is not actually tuna. Of snapper, which is kind of funny, mislabeled 87% of the time. In reality, any one of six different species was sold, was sold fraudulently more often. Disturbingly, 84% of the fish samples, again, white tuna, was escalar, which is a snake mackerel that has a rich buttery flesh but unpleasant side effects, as we stated earlier. It says the diet of escalar is rich in whack esters, a mixture of fatty acids to fatty alcohol that just builds up in the body of the fish. So your body consumes it and it just goes right through you. So a lot of you which are on diets consuming white tuna, because white tuna is actually really good, but you're not really getting white tuna. What they also recommend in the Ocean Institute, if the price seems too good to be true, then guess what? It is too good to be true. So know your sources, <laughs> validate your sources. Unfortunately, when consumed, humans in bigger quantity than six ounces, da 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 da. All right, they also said too, that only, look at this, wait, I'm gonna back up. In major cities like Chicago, Austin, New York, and Washington, D.C., this is according to Oceana who did the study, every single sushi restaurant that was tested sold mislabeled tuna. That's every single as in 100%. That's bizarre. Oceana warned that currently more than 90% of the seafood consumed in the United States is imported. So think about that. But less than 1% is inspected by the government specifically for fraud. And just to recap, this is what it said. Mislabeling was found in 27 of the 46 fish types, uh, fish types, which is 59%. Snapper, cod, tuna, sole, halibut, and group were the top collected fish types, which were basically fraudulent. 87% of snapper, 59% of tumor, tuna, were most commonly mislabeled fish types. Only, one, only seven of the 120 snapper samples tested were basically labeled honestly. And it goes on and on and on. About 44% of all grocery stores, restaurants, and sushi venues visited sold mislabeled seafood. So my time is running out, but something to think about as far as what's out there. When you're going to buy seafood, know your source. Buy from validated source. All because you recognize it as a brand name does not mean it's not counterfeit. So maybe boost it up a little bit, a little higher quality, and you'd be a lot safer. One of the more disturbing facts they found out is a lot of the fish that's being sold which is being consumed for kids is varieties which have been banned in the US mm -hmm. because of high mercury content. Yeah. So go back to when you're feeding your kids fish that you think is labeled something honestly and it's not, and you're basically feeding them contaminated fish. Something to think about Well, my time is up, and thank you once again. Thank you very much, Ralph. Once again, do your research, and if you need to access our show, um, besides TAP TV, it's uh, youtube.com forward slash VH film. Thank you very much.